I am ASMR Illumination, and this is Jane Eyre, Volume 1, Chapter 11, Part 2. The chamber looked such a bright little place to me, as the sun shone in between the gay blue chintz window curtains, showing papered walls and a carpeted floor, so unlike the bare planks and disdained plaster of low wood, that my spirits rose at the view. Externals have a great effect on the young. I thought that a fair era of life was beginning for me, one that was to have its flowers and pleasures, as well as its thorns and toils. My faculties, roused by the change of scene, the new field offered to hope, seemed all astir. I could not precisely define what they expected, but it was something pleasant. Not perhaps that day, or that month, but at an indefinite future period. I rose and dressed myself with care, obliged to be plain, for I had no article of attire that was not made with extreme simplicity. I was still, by nature, solicitous to be neat. It was not my habit to be disregardful of appearance or careless of the impression I made. On the contrary, I ever wished to look as well as I could and to please as much as my want of beauty would permit. I sometimes regretted that I was not handsomer. I sometimes wished to have rosy cheeks, a straight nose, and small cherry mouth. I desired to be tall, stately, and finely developed in figure. I felt it a misfortune that I was so little, so pale, and had features so irregular and so marked. And why had I these aspirations and these regrets? It would be difficult to say. I could not then distinctly say it to myself. Yet I had a reason, and a logical, natural reason, too. However, when I had brushed my hair very smooth and put on my black frock, which... Quaker-like as it was, at least, had the merit of fitting to a nicety, and adjusted my clean white tucker, I thought I should do respectably enough to appear before Mrs. Fairfax, and so that my new pupil would not, at least, recoil from me with antipathy. Having opened my chamber window, and seen that I left all things straight and neat on the toilet table, I ventured forth. Traversing the long and matted gallery, I descended the slippery steps of oak. Then I gained the hall. I halted there a minute. I looked at some pictures on the walls. One, I remember, represented a grim man in a cuirass, and one, a lady with powdered hair, and a pearl necklace. At a bronze lamp pendant from the ceiling, at a great clock whose case was of oak, curiously carved and ebon black with time and rubbing. Everything appeared very stately and imposing to me. But then, I was so little accustomed to grandeur. The hall door, which was half of glass, stood open. I stepped over the threshold. It was a fine autumn morning. The early sun shone serenely on embrowned groves and still green fields. Advancing onto the lawn, I looked up and surveyed the front of the mansion. 
It was three stories high, of proportions not vast, though considerable. A gentleman's manor house, not a nobleman's seat. Battlements round the top gave it a picturesque look. Its grey front stood out well from the background of a rookery, whose calling tenants were now on the wing. They flew over the lawn and grounds to alight in a great meadow, from which these were separated by a sunk fence, and were an array of mighty old thorn trees, strong, knotty, and broad as oaks, and once explained the etymology of the mansion's designation. Farther off were hills, not so lofty as those round Lowood, nor so craggy, nor so like barriers of separation from the living world, but yet quiet and lonely hills enough, and seeming to embrace Thornfield with a seclusion I had not expected to find existent, so near the stirring locality of Millcote. A little hamlet, whose roofs were blunt with trees, straggled up the side of one of these hills. The church of the district stood near a thorn field. Its old tower top looked over a knoll between the house and gates. I was yet enjoying the calm prospect and pleasant fresh air, yet listening with delight to the calling of the rooks, yet surveying the wide, hoary front of the hall, and thinking what a great place it was for one lonely little dame like Mrs. Fairfax to inhabit, when that lady appeared at the door. What? Out already? said she. I see you are an early riser. I went up to her and was received with an affable kiss and shake of the hand. How do you like Thornfield? she asked. I told her I liked it very much. Yes, she said. It is a pretty place, but I fear it will be getting out of order unless Mr. Rochester should take it into his head to come and reside here permanently. Or at least visit it rather oftener. Great houses and fine grounds require the presence of the proprietor. Mr. Rochester, I exclaimed. Who is he? The owner of Thornfield. She responded quietly. Did you not know he was called Rochester? Of course I did not. I had never heard of him before. But the old lady seemed to regard his existence as a universally understood fact, with which everybody must be acquainted by instinct. I thought, I continued, Thornfield belonged to you. To me. Bless you, child, what an idea. To me. I am only the housekeeper, the manager. To be sure, I am distantly related to the Rochesters by the mother's side. Or at least my husband was. He was a clergyman incumbent of Hay, that little village yonder on the hill. And that church near the gates was his. The present Mr. Rochester's mother was a Fairfax, and second cousin to my husband. But I never presume on the connection. In fact, it is nothing to me. I consider myself quite in the light of an ordinary housekeeper. My employer is always civil, and I expect nothing more. And the little girl, my pupil, she is Mr. Rochester's ward. He commissioned me to find a governess for her. He intends to have her brought up in Shire, I believe. Here she comes with her bun, as she calls her nurse. 
The enigma then was explained. This affable and kind little widow was no great dame, but a dependent like myself. I did not like her the worse for that. On the contrary, I felt better pleased than ever. The equality between her and me was real, not the mere result of condescension on her part. So much the better my position was all the freer. As I was meditating on this discovery, a little girl, followed by her attendant, came running up the lawn. I looked at my pupil, who did not at first appear to notice me. She was quite a child, perhaps seven or eight years old, slightly built, with a pale, small-featured face, and a redundancy of hair falling in curls to her waist. Good morning, Miss Adela, said Mrs. Fairfax. Come and speak to the lady who is to teach you, and to make you a clever woman some day. She approached. C'est là ma gouvernante, said she, pointing to me, and addressing her nurse, who answered, Mais oui, certainement. Are they foreigners? I inquired, amazed at hearing the French language. The nurse is a foreigner, and Adela was born on the continent, and I believe never left it till within six months ago. When she first came here, she could speak no English. Now she can make shift to talk it a little. I don't understand her. She mixes it so with French. But you will make out her meaning very well, I dare say. Fortunately, I had had the advantage of being taught French by a French lady. And as I had always made a point of conversing with Madame Pirot as often as I could, and had besides, during the last seven years, learnt a portion of French by heart daily, applying myself to take pains with my accent, and imitating as closely as possible the pronunciation of my teacher, I had acquired a certain degree of readiness and correctness in the language, and was not likely to be much at a loss with Mademoiselle Adela. She came and shook hands with me, when she heard that I was her governess. And as I led her into breakfast, I addressed some phrases to her in her own tongue. She replied briefly at first, but after we were seated at the table, and she had examined me some ten minutes with her large hazel eyes, she suddenly commenced chattering fluently. Ah! cried she, in French. You speak my language as well as Mr. Rochester does. I can talk to you as I can to him, and so can Sophie. She will be glad nobody here understands her. Madame Fairfax is all English. Sophie is my nurse. She came with me over the sea in a great ship with a chimney that smoked. How it did smoke. And I was sick, and so was Sophie, and so was Mr. Rochester. Mr. Rochester lay down on a sofa in a pretty room called the Salon, and Sophie and I had little pets in another place. I nearly fell out of mine. It was like a shelf. And Mademoiselle, what is your name? Eyre. Jane Eyre. Eyre? Oh, bah. I cannot say it. Well, our ship stopped in the morning before it was quite daylight at a great city, a huge city, with very dark houses and all smoky. Not at all like the pretty, clean town I come from. And Mr. Rochester carried me in his arms over a plank to the land. And Sophie came after, and we all got into a coach which took us to a beautiful large house, larger than this and finer, called a hotel. We stayed there nearly a week. 
I and Sophie used to walk every day in a great green place full of trees called the park. And there were many children there besides me and a pond with beautiful birds in it that I fed with crumbs. Can you understand her when she runs on so fast? asked Mrs. Fairfax. I understood her very well, for I had been accustomed to the fluent tongue of Madame Pierrot. I wish, continued the good lady, you would ask her a question or two about her parents. I wonder if she remembers them. Adele, I inquired, with whom did you live when you were in that pretty clean town you spoke of? I lived long ago with Mama, but she has gone to the Holy Virgin. Mama used to teach me to dance and sing and to say verses. A great many gentlemen and ladies came to see Mama, and I used to dance before them or to sit on their knees and sing to them. I liked it. Shall I let you hear me sing now? She had finished her breakfast so I permitted her to give a specimen of her accomplishments. Descending from her chair, she came and placed herself on my knee. Then, folding her little hands demurely before her, shaking back her curls and lifting her eyes to the ceiling, she commenced singing a song from some opera. It was the strain of a forsaken lady who, after bewailing the perfidy of her lover, calls pride to her aid, desires her attendant to deck her in her brightest jewels and richest robes, and resolves to meet the false one that night at a ball, and prove to him, by the gaiety of her demeanor, how little his desertion has affected her. The subject seemed strangely chosen for an infant singer. But I suppose the point of the exhibition lay in hearing the notes of love and jealousy warbled with the lisp of childhood. And in very bad taste, that point was. At least, I thought so. Adele sang the canzonette tunefully enough, and with the naivete of her age, this achieved, she jumped from my knee and said, Now, mademoiselle, I will repeat you some poetry. Assuming an attitude, she began, La Ligue des Rats, Fable de la Fontaine. She then declaimed the little piece with an attention to punctuation and emphasis. The flexibility of voice and an appropriateness of gesture very unusual indeed at her age, and which proved she had been carefully trained. Was it your mamma who taught you that piece? I asked. Yes, and she just used to say it in this way. Café Vuitton, lui dit un sera, parle. She made me lift my hand so to remind me to raise my voice at the question. Now, shall I dance for you? No, that will do. But after your mama went to the Holy Virgin, as you say, with whom did you live then? With Madame Frédéric and her husband. She took care of me, but she is nothing related to me. I think she is poor, for she had not so fine a house as mama. It was not long there. Mr. Rochester asked me if I would like to go and live with him in England, and I said yes. For I knew Mr. Rochester before I knew Madame Frédéric, and he was always kind to me and gave me pretty dresses and toys. But you see, he has not kept his word, for he has brought me to England, and now he has gone back again himself, and I never see him. After breakfast, Adele and I withdrew to the library, which room, it appears, Mr. Rochester had directed 
should be used as the schoolroom. Most of the books were locked up behind glass doors, but there was one bookcase left open containing everything that could be needed in the way of elementary works, and several volumes of light literature, poetry, biography, travels, a few romances, etc. I suppose he had considered that these were all the governess would require for her private perusal. And indeed, they contented me amply for the present. Compared with the scanty pickings I had now and then been able to glean at Lowood, they seemed to offer an abundant harvest of entertainment and information. In this room, too, there was a cabinet piano, quite new and of superior tone, also an easel for painting and a pair of globes. I found my pupil sufficiently docile, though disinclined to apply. She had not been used to regular occupation of any kind. I felt it would be injudicious to confine her too much at first. So when I had talked to her a great deal, and got her to learn a little, and when the morning had advanced to noon, I allowed her to return to her nurse. I then proposed to occupy myself till dinner time in drawing some little sketches for her use. As I was going upstairs to fetch my portfolio and pencils, Mrs. Fairfax called to me. Your morning school hours are over now. I suppose, said she. She was in a room, the folding doors of which stood open. I went in when she addressed me. It was a large, stately apartment, with purple chairs and curtains, a turkey carpet, walnut-paneled walls, one vast window, rich in stained glass, and a lofty ceiling, nobly molded. Mrs. Fairfax was dusting some vases of fine purple spar, which stood on a sideboard. What a beautiful room, I exclaimed, as I looked round, for I had never before seen any half so imposing. Yes, this is the dining room. I have just opened the window to let in a little air and sunshine, for everything gets so damp in apartments that are seldom inhabited. The drawing room yonder feels like a vault. She pointed to a wide arch corresponding to the window and hung like it with a Tyrian dyed curtain now looped up. Mounting to it by two broad steps and looking through, I thought I caught a glimpse of a fairy place. So bright to my novice eyes appeared the view beyond. Yet it was merely a very pretty drawing room, and within it a boudoir, both spread with white carpets, on which seemed laid brilliant garlands of flowers, both sealed with snowy moldings of white grapes and fine leaves, beneath which glowed in rich contrast crimson couches and ottomans, while the ornaments on the pale parian mantelpiece were of sparkling bohemian glass, ruby red, and between the windows, large mirrors repeated the general blending of snow and fire. In what order you keep these rooms, Mrs. Fairfax, said I. No dust, no canvas coverings, except that the air feels chilly, one would think they were inhabited daily. Why, Miss Eyre, though Mr. Rochester's visits here are rare, they are always sudden and unexpected. And as I observed, that it put him out to find everything swathed up and to have a bustle of arrangement on his arrival, I thought it best to keep the rooms in readiness. Is Mr. Rochester an exacting, fastidious sort of man? Not particularly so, but he has a gentleman's tastes and habits, and he expects to have things managed in conformity to them. 
Do you like him? Is he generally liked? Oh, yes. The family have always been respected here. Almost all the land in this neighborhood, as far as you can see, has belonged to the Rochesters, time out of mind. Well, but leaving his land out of the question, do you like him? Is he liked for himself? I have no cause to do otherwise than like him. And I believe he is considered a just and liberal landlord by his tenants. But he has never lived much amongst them. But has he no peculiarities? What, in short, is his character? Oh, his character is unimpeachable, I suppose. He is rather peculiar, perhaps. He has traveled a great deal and seen a great deal of the world, I should think. I dare say he is clever. But I never had much conversation with him. In what way is he peculiar? I don't know. It is not easy to describe. Nothing striking, but you feel it when he speaks to you. You cannot be always sure whether he is in jest or earnest, whether he is pleased or the contrary. You don't thoroughly understand him, in short. At least, I don't. But it is of no consequence. He is a very good master. This was all the account I got from Mrs. Fairfax of her employer and mine. There are people who seem to have no notion of sketching a character or observing and describing salient points, either in persons or things. The good lady evidently belonged to this class. My query is puzzled, but did not draw her out. Mr. Rochester was... Mr. Rochester, in her eyes. A gentleman. A landed proprietor, nothing more. She inquired and searched no further, and evidently wondered at my wish to gain a more definite notion of his identity. When we left the dining room, she proposed to show me over the rest of the house, and I followed her upstairs and downstairs, Admiring as I went, for all was well arranged and handsome. The large front chambers I thought especially grand, and some of the third-story rooms, though dark and low, were interesting from their air of antiquity. The furniture, once appropriated to the lower apartments, had from time to time been removed here as fashions changed, and the imperfect light entering by their narrow casements, showed bedsteads of a hundred years old, chests in oak or walnut, looking with their strange carvings of palm branches and cherub's heads, like types of the Hebrew Ark. Rows of venerable chairs, high-backed and narrow, stools still more antiquated, on whose cushioned tops were yet apparent traces of half-effaced embroideries wrought by fingers that for two generations had been coffin dust. All these relics gave to the third story of Thornfield Hall the aspect of a home of the past, a shrine of memory. I liked the hush, the gloom, the quaintness of these retreats in the day. But I by no means coveted a night's repose on one of those wide and heavy beds, shut in some of them with doors of oak, shaded others with wrought old English hangings crusted with thick work, portraying effigies of strange flowers and stranger birds and strangest human beings, all which would have looked strange indeed by the pallid gleam of moonlight. Do the servants sleep in these rooms? I asked. No, they occupy a range of smaller apartments to the back. No one ever sleeps here. One would almost say that 
If there were a ghost at Thornfield Hall, this would be its haunt. So I think you have no ghost, then. None that I ever heard of, returned Mrs. Fairfax, smiling. Nor any traditions of one. No legends or ghost stories. I believe not. And yet, it is said, the Rochesters have been rather a violent than a quiet race in their time. Perhaps, though, that is the reason they rest tranquilly in their graves now. Yes, after life's fitful fever, they sleep well, I muttered. Where are you going now, Mrs. Fairfax? For she was moving away. On to the leads. Will you come and see the view from thence? I followed still, up a very narrow staircase to the attics, and thence by a ladder and through a trap door to the roof of the hall. I was now on a level with the crow colony and could see into their nest. Leaning over the battlements and looking far down, I surveyed the grounds laid out like a map. The bright and velvet lawn closely girdling the gray base of the mansion. The field, wide as a park, dotted with its ancient timber. The wood, dun and sear, divided by a path visibly overgrown, greener with moss than the trees were with foliage. The church at the gates, the road, the tranquil hills all reposing in the autumn day's sun, the horizons bounded by a propitious sky, azure, marbled with pearly white. No feature in the scene was extraordinary, but all was pleasing. When I turned from it and repassed the trap door, I could scarcely see my way down the ladder. The attic seemed black as a vault compared with that arch of blue air to which I had been looking up, and to that sunlit scene of grove, pasture, and green hill of which the hall was the center, and over which I had been gazing with delight. Mrs. Fairfax stayed behind a moment to fasten the trap door. I, by dint of groping, found the outlet from the attic and proceeded to descend the narrow garret staircase. I lingered in the long passage to which this led, separating the front and back rooms of the third story. Narrow, low, and dim, with only one little window at the far end, and looking with its two rows of small black doors all shut, like a corridor in some bluebeard's castle. While I paced softly on, the last sound I expected to hear, in so still a region, a laugh struck my ear. It was a curious laugh, distinct, formal, mirthless, I stopped. The sound ceased only for an instant. It began again louder, for at first, though distinct, it was very low. It passed off in a clamorous peal that seemed to wake an echo in every lonely chamber, though it originated but in one, and I could have pointed out the door whence the accents issued. Mrs. Fairfax, I called out, for I now heard her descending the garret stairs. Did you hear that loud laugh? Who is it? Some of the servants, very likely, she answered. Perhaps Grace Poole. Did you hear it? I again inquired. Yes, plainly. I often hear her. She sews in one of these rooms. Sometimes Leah is with her. They are frequently noisy together. The laugh was repeated in its low syllabic tone and terminated in an awed murmur. Grace, exclaimed Mrs. Fairfax. 
I really did not expect any grace to answer. The laugh was as tragic, as preternatural a laugh as any I ever heard. And but that it was high noon, and that no circumstance of ghostliness accompanied the curious cachination, but that neither scene nor season favored fear, I should have been superstitiously afraid. However, the event showed me I was a fool for entertaining a sense even of surprise. The door nearest me opened, and a servant came out. A woman between thirty and forty, a sad, square-made figure, red-haired, and with a hard, plain face. Any apparition less romantic or less ghostly could scarcely be conceived. Too much noise, Grace, said Mrs. Fairfax. Remember directions. Grace curtsied silently and went in. She is a person we have to sew and assist Leah in her housemaid's work, continued the widow. Not altogether unobjectionable in some points, but she does well enough. By the by, how have you got on with your new pupil this morning? The conversation, thus turned on a dove, continued till we reached the light and cheerful region below. Adele came running to meet us in the hall, exclaiming, Madame, vous êtes servie, adding, J'ai bien faim, moi. We found dinner ready and waiting for us in Mrs. Fairfax's room.